Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Brew. Today we are moving from Judges slash Ruth into 1 Samuel, which begins with the story of Hannah, one of the few women to write scripture, as her song is included in Holy Writ. It seems to indeed be prophetic, although I don't think she's ever called a prophetess in scripture. Um, well, then neither is Mary, but that's true. She, they both sing songs that represent their own Bible study and uh, are nonetheless the fruit of God's inspiration and spirit. Mm -hmm. So the story thus far, it's the time of the judges still. First Samuel overlaps with the end of Judges. So this is about the, the Samuel's being born about the same time that Samson's being born and about the same time that Obed, Ruth's son, is being born. So there's a lot going on here. In Israel, that means that to the south, the Philistines are a big deal. And somewhere in here, they're going to start, well, exercising authority, shall we say, over Judah and Dan and some of the southern tribes. In fact, before it's done, they're going to have most of Israel under their thumb. They're going to disarm them. There's this a, a milder, kinder, gentler tyranny. You know, but they don't take absolutely all of their food, as some of the invading tribes have done. And they don't seem to try to impose idolatry on them. Uh, nor does Israel seem overly fond of uh, the Philistine gods. It's just sort of... Um, yeah, they're in charge and we're not. And uh, it's been that way a long time now. And I um, hope no one upsets that. See Samuel's adventure, or Samson's adventures. Meanwhile, back at home, we know we've seen that the Levites from the beginning of the period of the judges have not been doing well. And now we see it coming to fruition in the tabernacle, which is in Shiloh at this point. Eli is both high priest and judge. So uh, one short of Samuel being the last of the judges. Uh, he's not very competent. He's kind of a pushover, especially where his sons are concerned. His sons have grown up to be very wicked men, and yet they are priests. Uh, they strong arm the people who come with offerings and take what they want, the best of the meat, rather than letting them offer it to the Lord on God's terms. So they're discouraging people from worship. And they are they're giving vent to their um, their lust for food and drink, but also to their sexual lust. They are raping the women who serve in the tabernacle. So it's really, really bad. You thought the Levites were bad. These guys are really, really horrible. And they're using the force of institutional worship to do their and horrible th things. And they are, and in the process, as is the way of things, destroying the very institutional power, the power of the institution, because more and more people are despising the worship of the Lord and not wanting to go up to the tabernacle knowing this is what they'll get. Sort of like the liberal churches a few generations back who basically kicked out the gospel and expected that the pastors would nonetheless be paid, only to find <laughs> out that the only people who stay were a few old people who actually believe the gospel because they didn't want to give up the churches they'd gone to their whole life and everyone else left. And suddenly the pastors were without, without income. Because oddly enough, people go to church, want to go to church. <laughs> people want to worship God. Oddly enough, want to worship God. So, and, and that would all be bad enough. This uh, family we're focusing on, the husband is named Elkanah. He's fairly wealthy, apparently. He has two wives, which he shouldn't. He has the wife, Hannah, or if you don't know the aspiration, Anna would be the other equivalent. It means grace. And the other one is named Penina, or Penina. Penina is how it's accented in the King James. And she's a piece of work. Now, I ain't married her, I'll never know. But she, but here's the problem. Hannah has a barren womb. Now, to those of us who know the Bible, oh no, one of those again? That means, <laughs> yeah, it does, but it takes a while to get there. Penina, on the other hand, has lots of kids. We're not told how many, but apparently um, at least two of each and probably more. Because sons and all her sons and daughters. Well, Alcana, despite his bigamy, is faithful to go up to the tabernacle for Passover every year. Possibly the other feast, but Passover is highlighted. And he takes his family with him, which was not required. So that's good. And as he's offering peace offerings, 
he makes sure that Hannah, who is his favorite wife, gets the biggest cut of the nicest cut of the meat. But of course, Peninnah has herself and all of her children, so he has to dice it out so that everybody gets something substantial. Of course, he's got to eat too. So when it's all done, you can bet that Peninnah is noticing that Hannah's getting the favored slights <laughs> every time. Peninnah already doesn't like Hannah. She's a rival. But she is the wife of a Levite who does, in fact, love God in spite of this bigamy thing. And she provokes Hannah, the text says. Now, we're not told exactly what she said. But knowing how these things work in our generation, it was probably something along the lines of, Oh, dear, sweet Hannah, child, having so many children is such a blessing from God. You know, God promises lots of children to those who serve him faithfully. And I, it is just such a delight and glory to have all these children. Oh, I'm so, I'm so sorry you don't have any. I think, you know, it might even be more cutting if she's like, oh, you must be so happy not to have all these mouths to feed. <laughs> think, you could. Yeah. You could do it that way, but I'm going out because I think there's a gospel <laughs> angle here. Of, you know, if you walked more faithfully with the mm. Lord, I'm sure he would open your room. I'll be praying for you that you two can know the blessings of God, poor soul. <laughs> However, she said it with whatever dripping uh, honey of hypocrisy came off of her lips. The text calls her Hannah's adversary. And it's not the same word that she's, word choice. <laughs> yeah, it's not the same word that she's for Satan, but it's close enough. I mean, adversary, yeah, we know who that is. And and the question becomes, well, why? Well, hopefully the way we phrased it so far is pretty clear why. And and I have seen this in my your generation. It was a thing a decade or two ago. If you are blessed of the Lord, you will have lots of children. Mm. The quiverful you, movement. Yeah. And you oh, should it's seek, still around. Yeah. And you should seek lots of children. And if you don't, if somehow your womb is being closed up, well, sorry, God isn't blessing you the way he's blessing us. It is or easily can become a thing of works righteousness. An odd sort of work, since the people involved are wholly passive, except for, you know, one thing. But it's it, it's that. Blessing is concrete in the form of children. And, and I actually had someone at a time when I was not yet married, I had a young man who didn't know much, say, I, I can't understand why you wouldn't want to get married and have as many children as you can. Well, I want to get married. I want to marry the right woman, however. <laughs> and as for children, that's going to be in God's sense. I don't remember where that whole conversation went, but it was just sort of the, yeah, I, 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 when I get married, I'm just going to have as many children as I can. That's nice if you want to have lots of children. And if your wife's body can... And if your wife's <laughs> body <handle> can <laughs> hold up to it, you know, there are some guys who, who will kill their wives. And the desire to produce more seed. There is no love for the wife here. No, there isn't. It is a brutal sort of thing. And there are women who well, take it upon themselves as a form mm -hmm. of sadomasochism because they are more blessed of God and God approves of them more than of other people if they do this. And that's not what God's at. God just nowhere says have as many children as you possibly can. It just it's not in the text. You're not going to find it anywhere. He God commands. also tells us elsewhere that we need to steward our resources yes. well. And if you are having so many children that you have no resources left, Something's it's not stewarding your resources well. <laughs> you need to be able to take care of your children. And often we are fearful. We, we, we expect, well, I need to maintain everything at this level that I'm used to. The Bible doesn't say that either. But there, there, there is a wisdom here. And that's what terrifies people. Mm -hmm. Wisdom and free choice. <laughs> we don't <laughs> like having to determine these things for ourselves. No, we want clear lines to tell us what to do. We want a list of rules. Mm -hmm. And when and we, we have kept these rules. And we can apply to everyone else. <laughs> yes. We can judge <laughs> us and each other by how well this list is followed. We don't want, no one wants nuance. <laughs> no. And, and they will be rules, of course, that we are capable of following. Yeah. Or there will be an exception because our case is special. Or there will be an exception because our case is special. This is the religion of works righteousness. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think any of us here are against large families. No. Uh, we would have loved to have more children, but there were light, literal life and death issues at stake. I, I needed to decide with my wife whether or not 
Um, I wanted her to die next time she had a baby. But I, I, but I came, personal testimony, I came from, I was never, I did not grow up around small children. The first small child I ever was around, you, of course, both know the Farshmans, their little girl, Talitha, she was just about to be two and about to speak her first word when I got married. And we were living in the same house at the time. So I didn't, I, I had no sense emotionally of a need for children. What I had was a Bible that told me God said, be fruitful and multiply. And that marriage is a good thing and the children are a good thing. And I believed God, although I had no personal emotional investment as such. Guess what? God was right. Isn't that amazing? Being married is a good thing. Having children is a good thing. And when we first started out, it was kind of, I don't know about, you know, my wife is saying, all the children we can. And I'm saying one or two. <laughs> I think actually I said two or three, um, which we ended up with three, for which we are we're very thankful. Um, and so we're not condemning anybody who has nine or 10 or 12. But as you look at scripture, there aren't that many people who have nine or 10 or 12. And the one who had 12 had to cheat to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so we need to be very careful in setting limits for anyone, including ourselves. Mm -hmm. You like having children, you make it work, praise God. And that could be a wonderful thing. But when you start using it as a spiritual yardstick to beat down other people or yourself, and this can happen, I've seen it happen, there's a problem there. And so Hannah feels provoked, abused, to use a modern word. She sees in Penina an adversary, not simply on a personal emotional level, but on a gospel level. She's preaching at her a gospel of work salvation. And, and here's another thought. It's one thing to know intellectually and, and to have a heart commitment to the gospel. And yet when you are daily slammed with a works righteousness gospel, it is sometimes very hard not to feel guilty, mm -hmm. not to feel the pressures. Well, they're able to do this. They can give this much. They can have these many kids. They can go out on a limb for Christ. They can, And you list all the things that they spend so many hours of prayer. And you can look at all the things they do. And in, and in and of themselves, this may be great things, but I'm a lousy Christian because I don't. I need to start doing these things so God will like me. There is a constant temptation here because we are sinners and the flesh likes to reassert itself. And the flesh here is that of works righteousness. So I will do stuff to make God like me and God bless me and I will get God's favor. And Hannah had to deal with that. She had to keep pushing that away and not letting it get to her and not giving in. And what we come to later in, in the, the first chapter of Samuel, she's at the tabernacle and all this has just become too much for her. She's human. She's feeling the way. She does want a son for all kinds of reasons and maybe for some bad reasons because she's human. But there are a lot of good reasons for wanting to have a baby. And so in bitterness of soul, she goes before the Lord and vows a vow and says, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look upon the affliction of thy handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaiden, but will give unto thy handmaid a man-child, very specific, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. There shall no razor come upon his head. I will place him under a permanent Nazarite vow. Now, there's a side issue that we as good Reformed Presbyterian people could talk about. Wait, she's making a vow on behalf of her son that will last his entire life and he has nothing to say? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, Think about that's how it. that works. <laughs> that's how that works. Think about that one. There's a lady at school yesterday who asked me, you're, you're, I, I was talking to this other lady yeah, about infant baptism because I go to a Reformed Baptist church and I just wanted to know you know, where, how that goes and it's not like Roman Catholic. No, it's not Roman Catholic. Um, <laughs> just wanted to know about that just because it's okay and you can tell. Uh, she said, maybe you could, I could talk to you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> not wanting to be the one who stirs up trouble at work. Or with a, or a congregation. <laughs> Let me take off my teacher hat yeah, here. Yeah, <laughs> well, I didn't. I did just a little. I, but um, thinking now, it's like, let me point you back to Hannah and Samuel. And you think about that. Because she did say, it has something to do with the covenant, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very good. Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. Um, ah. she was, uh, not that Baptists are apart from the kingdom no, of God. that was a joke, clarify. okay. <laughs> uh, we kind of skipped over uh, Elkanah's empty comfort for his wife. Where he, he's kind of tone deaf here. Um, he's, he's not helping her out with the, 
what she's actually emotionally going through and spiritually. Mm -hmm. it's, I don't know. You know, it's just Why we don't us, get though? much <laughs> of him beyond, you know, what we can pick up as apparently he's wealthy and we know he's a Levite and he loves Hannah, but this is not a flattering snapshot of him <laughs> loving and cherishing his wife here. Hannah, why weepest thou? Why, why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? No, dear, no. you're actually not. <laughs> <laughs> not the same thing remotely. You don't get it. You don't understand what's going on in your own household. And remember, this follows in the wake of the last chapters of Judges, where the Levites are the problem. And here we have a godly Levite who, again, compromised on the marriage front mm -hmm. and spiritually insensitive, although he he doubtless loves her emotionally and, and it's sentimental about her, does not know the first thing to do to meet her spiritual needs. He is a rotten spiritual doctor. So I'm sure we'll see him in heaven, but that doesn't help Hannah right now at all. So she has gone. And she has vowed that if God will give her a man-child, she will give back said man-child as a Nazarite to the Lord. And here we could spend a lot of time with Nazarites, but see the podcast on Samson. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm not going to redo all that right now. It's a lifelong vow in this case of service to the Lord to be defined by specific terms stated along the way. I do have an interesting question, yeah. and I hope it's not too long of a sidebar. But how does Hannah's vow to the Lord to give uh, her offspring to the Lord square with uh, male headship? If uh, does she have, how would she have the authority to make that kind of claim if she's not the head of her household? Well, the Bible never well, forbids women from making promises. The husband right. has the yeah. ability to annul to that if, as soon as he hears it. Ah, but yes. she has but if, absolutely. If he never hears it, <laughs> yeah, well, she's supposed to tell him at some point. And okay. also, this is a conditional vow to the Lord. Lord, if well, God can say no. no. <laughs> um, right, but yeah. uh, we, we will see. Um, Al Qaeda does does leave us with one 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 thing toward the end. In fact, I'll just skip ahead so we don't forget it later. When the, the baby is born, and Hannah says. I'm going to stay home with the baby until the baby's weaned, which means about three or so. Uh, and then I'll present it before the Lord. And Elkanah says, well, do what seems you good. Only the Lord establishes word. So uh, Elkanah okay. is on board with this. At what point he was told, we're not told exactly. Oh, okay. Well, that, that does answer my question then. Cool. Yeah. And, and also Eli, when she he sees her, sees Hannah praying back, back in time now. She is uh, so moved with sorrow and deep emotion that the words aren't coming out. It was normal for people for people to pray out loud, to talk to the Lord, not think at him. Although there are examples <laughs> of that in scripture as well. But more overwhelming, it's, it's talking. And so he's looking at someone who should be praying, that is talking out loud to God. And all, and she just seems to be moving her lips and, and, and looking emotionally stricken and incoherent. And he concludes that she's drunk. Well, he's seen enough drunkenness in his own family, you know, so that's probably his first thought. And he rebukes her and she says, no, 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 I, 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 that's not what's happening here. I poured out my soul before the Lord. And Eli says, go in peace and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition of the Lord that thou have asked him. Of him. He is a judge. He is the high priest. We're not told whether or not she exactly explained it, but he does commend her. Again, that does not remove Elkanah's headship. But he seems to, I mean, there's nothing here that says Elkanah is not on board with this or at any point pull, pulls back from it. Well, they go home. And lo and behold, in the providence of God, she conceives and bears a son and calls his name Samuel. And uh, they continue to do their, their yearly thing. And Hannah, as I said, says, I'm not going up until the child's weaned. And the only hint we have from Scripture is someplace in Chronicles where we're told that the, the Levites don't start getting official support until they're three years old, which suggests because, you know, breastfeeding and all that. So probably about that long in Egypt, it was four years. And when the time comes, she takes him up with all the appropriate offerings and presents him before the Lord to Eli. 
And apparently Eli adopts him into his household. So this would be a step up. He becomes at some level a member of the high priest's family. We're not told exactly what the details are. Uh, tying this back to our discussion of simony a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. um, is there a cost that Elkanah has yeah. to pay? Well, he's a Levite. If something we actually don't find out in Sandal, we have to read the genealogies of all things to find the out. The genealogies? Oh, no. They're so yeah. boring. To find out that he actually is a Levite. But going into the high priest's family, at the very least, there is a very expensive sacrifice. Three bullocks. A young That's bull a <laughs> is expensive. Three of them is a lot of money. I remember I said Okina was was wealthy, so he's he's on board with this. In addition to the the flour and the the, the whole bottle of wine, there'd be a you know sheepskin full of wine and all of that. Now the the thing that we will perhaps come back to in another time is, and she turns the boy over to Eli to raise, and our hands go to our face and we say, oh no, this cannot end well. Amazingly, it does. Mm -hmm. he, uh, Samson grows up to be a godly young man, although he's growing up in a household of uh, reprobate sons. So the ways of God are mysterious. Mm -hmm. And that brings us to chapter two, which is the thing that we want to talk about. Uh, it is straightforward in some ways in the light of the new covenant, and particularly in the light of Mar Mary's, I almost called it a soliloquy, her song. Mm -hmm. it, it's much easier to understand, but there's some things worth noting. Because Hannah is speaking here, not simply, and I think far too often it's, it's reduced to, I have a baby, my world is great. Mm -hmm. Rather than, this is one small expression of the movement of God in history. And God is going to use my son to do great things that go beyond me having a baby and being, being able to check off the list of, okay, approved of God on this account. This is God working. This is not me working. This is not works righteousness. This is the gospel. And so she prays, and, and many, many years later, a thousand years later, Mary will have studied her song and will innovate on it and, and play with it some. But the theme of the two songs is almost identical, and that is what I've called an eschatology of humility. Where, do, where and how does the kingdom of God progress? Along what lines, to what end? And how does it do that? Mm. Uh, if we're a good Marxist socialist, we will say, well, by violent revolution ending in bloody conflict between classes, which will bring down one order and establish another. <laughs> okay, we're not that. <clears throat> Seizing the means of production. Yeah. Despite things that have happened in our country within the last few years, that's not it. Yeah. <laughs> um, nor is voting the government more and more power to stop that from happening it because that's the same thing backwards. Right. <laughs> so what the Christian temptation has always been, well, let's force people to be good by taking control of enough power so that the people in power can take control of the environment and we will outlaw slavery, alcohol, tobacco, red meat. I'm still in the 1800s here. Uh, we will allow women's suffrage. We will, you know, you go down the list of all the external things which may or may not be good or bad. But if we give the government the power to deal with these, then the millennium, the latter day glory, will be at hand. The kingdom of God will arrive. And that's something that America in its its collective history has faced for a long time. Uh, it's it's a it's a perversion, a secularization of post millennialism. It's a utopianism. It's, we, we, we believe in a new order, we believe America's part of this, and we believe that it will happen when we get the right people in office and give them enough power to finally make the right changes. Unfortunately, it's also the socialist vision, <laughs> which is also a perversion of postmillennialism. Well, if the right person sits in the magic part of government, then everything is happy. <laughs> exactly. And then we've seen that too in America within the last few years. If only we get the right person in, that'll fix everything. The wrong person will end everything. Well, you know, right now they had some really bad people in power. Yeah. Um, can I jump in with an ignorant yeah. question? Yeah. Um, I have purposely not studied very much eschatology or history of eschatology because the fights just get so dirty. Um, <laughs> so I'm not super familiar with the history of postmillennialism, but it seems to me that there's something of this impulse even in the Puritans and Separatists. Oh, where absolutely. Our, our impulse is either to start afresh, make something new, or try and work on what we have until it's unsalvageable and we have to start fresh and start something <laughs> new again. And it's like, 
that's one area where I have a lot of sympathy for Anglicans who look at both of those options and say, no, you know, I'm not <laughs> sure what the answer is, but I'm pretty sure it's not either of those. Well, um, the purit the, the separatist was, this is dead, let's start over. The weakness there was they did not necessarily see that anything great and good would come, although at least the American separatists, the pilgrims, were open to it of being a stepping stone for others in the progress of the kingdom of God. But they didn't, as far as I know, did not write a lot about that. Puritans for a generation or two were very strongly what we would call today post-millennial. They believed in the latter day glory of the church or the millennium, whatever they wanted to call it, would come as the work of revival and reformation. That, that God gave one reformation, well, sure, there would be a second and a third. In the wake of the Great Awakening, it became more revival oriented. Mm -hmm. But America remained the focus because the revivals that happened then happened outside the churches. So the church was gradually being nudged aside. And they became more Christian people and the spirit of God and this emotionalism. This is what will happen. And then it took another step of secularization of who needs the gospel anyway? What we need is American people of goodwill. <laughs> you know, and it kept going this way. The, the, the question here is who wins in history? Mm -hmm. There are only two answers, <laughs> God or Satan. Um, and you can say Satan in any number of ways, some of which sound very pious and some of which sound outright Satanistic. To say that God wins in history, you didn't have to define what that means. Um, recently, we were interviewing, uh, we being the elders of righteous, we were interviewing a man to see if he would be fit to teach in our seminary. He did a fantastic job. We we're very pleased with him. It became my turn to ask a question about eschatology. And I said, I only got one for you because, you know, you're, you're basic Presbyterian. I trust your, your theology in general. And I'm not going to ask you a lot of technical questions. I just got one for you. Will the Great Commission be fulfilled? Mm. And he stopped. And he looked at me on, on, on uh, Skype or Zoom, when I guess we we're doing Zoom. And he looked at me and he hesitated because he knew exactly what I was asking, <laughs> which meant he was smart enough to understand that eschatology has implications. Hmm. And what he said is, I, I, he qualified it sort of like, I'm not going to talk about my you know formal position, but the answer is yes. Okay, that's all I want to know. Will all nations be made Jesus' disciples or not? Did Jesus give us a job that he never expected us to complete? And thus we can declare it done done with half the world unconverted and half the world never having heard the gospel. Postmillennialism has traditionally said that God will, in his good time, in his, by his goodwill, by the gospel, and not by government action or social action, bring the world into his kingdom. And that will have external effects. Now, arguing that exegetically, as opposed to theologically is another issue, which we can do another time, except, well, we're going to do a little bit right now. So let's look at, <laughs> okay. let's look at Hannah's song and see what she says. And I will try to pick up the pace now. Because it's a prayer, but it is a poem. And she's been doing a lot of Bible study because she draws together from other things that were extant already, as other people will draw on hers. It goes like this. My heart rejoiceth in Yahweh. My horn is exalted in Yahweh. My mouth is enlarge, enlarged over mine enemies, plural because I rejoice in thy salvation. She's not simply thinking about Peninnah. She has a lot of enemies. There are the Philistines. There are the wicked priests. There are the wicked nations that try to destroy Israel. She takes God's enemies as her own. This is not a purely fa mm. familial kind of things. Mm -hmm. And she's able to exalt in God's power and rejoice in his salvation. For there is none holy as the Lord, neither is, and there is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our rock. God is like is unlike all other gods. We're talking both in his, we're talking essentially about his essence, but also which is the same thing about his character. Talk no more exceeding so exceeding proudly. And we think again, we can think first of all of Penina, but it goes beyond that. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. It's plural, by the way. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. God judges in history. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that are stumbled are girded with strength, so that they they that were full have hired themselves out for bread, and they that were hungry ceased from being hungry. So that the barren hath borne seven, and she's only had one, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. She's describing a great reversal in history, the proud, the arrogant, the power of the rich and famous, take what they want. Um, and God's going to take it away from them and bring them down and exalt his own people in history. But it is important, again, that God does this. 
-hmm. This is not some kind of Marxist socialist program where the proletariat goes out and seizes the means of production and tears down existing structures to introduce a new utopia. This is uh, God's people trusting him and walking with him. And then God takes care of a lot of the social issues. And then she goes on and again, celebrates the attributes of Yahweh. Yahweh kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. And this is the first clear description, unless you include Job, of resurrection, that the God who kills is the God who raises from the dead. Uh, this, this woman is honored by God in a lot of remarkable ways. And that's one of the first prophecy, clear prophecy of resurrection, although it's implied from the beginning. Well, we've got Abraham. Yeah. And- Knowing that God will raise Isaac from the dead after he offers him. Yeah, but he doesn't say that. And she <laughs> says it. And yeah. Being the first one to get to say something, even when everybody already knows it, you know. <laughs> Daddy, can I say it? Can I say it? Okay, you go ahead and say it. Um, he, the Lord, maketh poor and maketh rich. Uh, economic circumstances are in God's hands. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raises up the poor out of the dust and lifts up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon. This is not a uh, cosmological statement about how the world is shaped and whether or not the earth is flat. That's (laughs) something else. This is a description of society. The pillars of the earth are those offices, institutions, and persons that God has ordained to stabilize society. Kings, priests, prophets, pastors, judges generals. These these are all offices that belong to God. The powers that be are ordained of God. And God can and will in his good time exalt his people into these offices. It's not their job to grab for them and get them at any cost, although we should be ready and willing should God give them to us. Uh, This Again, this is not a social program whereby we bring about the kingdom by our efforts. This is a program of humility, bowing before God, of rejoicing in God, and then letting God in history, in history, not simply beyond it, not in some future millennium beyond the second coming, or in heaven, or in a merely spiritual sense, act. But God acts in history. This is clearly what she expects. He will keep the feet of his saints, perseverance of the saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail, good or bad, righteous or unrighteous, faithful or unbelieving. Men don't prevail by their own strength. God sets the parameters. God accomplishes purposes. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. Think of Psalm 2, where the sun dashes in pieces all his adversaries. He shall, out of heaven, he shall thunder upon them. This is not a future millennium where Jesus reigns on the earth. This is in history while Jesus sits at God's right hand. Yahweh shall judge the ends of the earth. This is not only Israel. This is all of earth and all of history. And he shall give strength unto his king. Uh, we really, that we've had one reference that kings shall come out of thy loins and the scepter shall not depart from Judah. So she gets a privilege in even mentioning the king to come and exalt the horn of his anointed. And as far as I know, this is the first use of the word Messiah. Mm-hmm. So God honors her enormously in using her to produce this song for his people to sing. Uh, the, the reference to king and to anointed would first of all be to David, who is just around the corner and whom Samuel, her, her son, will anoint to office. But ultimately, all of this is pointing to Messiah. God's intervening in history. And although things seem horrible and everything's going downhill and the world's falling apart and the enemies are at the gate, no, the enemies are in the sanctuary. There's no spiritual leadership. No one's preaching the gospel. It's all over. God's just beginning. And God's about to turn things upside down. And that doesn't mean it will be a sweet, peaceful ride for God's people. He doesn't say that. He just says that God's got you covered. And God knows what he's doing. And this is called an adventure story. (laughs) Ever want to be an adventure story? (laughs) I also wanted to just draw the parallel to um, the Magnificat in Luke. Uh, where where Mary, her heart overflows with prophetic praise. And Mm -hmm. there's so many parallels and uh, things that line up in what you've uh, pointed out in uh, Hannah's song and what Mary praises God with. 
He that is mighty hath done great thing done to me great things, and holy is his name, his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm, he hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats, and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. I skip part of the beginning there, but it's also beautiful in that if you're right that this is the first usage of the term Messiah Mm -hmm. in Hannah's song, then all these parallels, A, you have two women who are barren in some sense, Mm -hmm. Mary being a virgin can't. Just right. spontaneously it's like the give most birth. barren of all barrennesses. The <laughs> most barren. She's more barren than anyone. Um, yeah. But then also, they are both gifted children. Now, Mary has the special privilege of having an angel tell her point <laughs> right. to her face. You're yeah. going to have this uh, before any any request is made. And they both respond with prophetic words that become enshrined in scripture and both speak of the same kinds of things. And one is looking forward to the Messiah, and the other one is in response to being told the Messiah is coming. Right. Mm-hmm. In fact, the Messiah is now in her womb. And the response of Mary, I think, behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it according to your word. Not the way, I will now go out and change society. It's, I will do as you've said, and I will submit mm-hmm. passively to what you are doing inside me. Well, that, that's it, also the other well. thing is yeah. that neither of these songs are a call to action, right. a let's go out and do this. This is a response saying this is what the Lord has done or will do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Which is the gospel. Which it's is it's the not gospel. a religion of do this. It's a religion of God has done that. Um, yeah. And it reminds me too of, uh, well, first I'll just throw out, there was a woman named Anna who was serving in the temple when Jesus yes, was born. Yes, there was. Uh, <laughs> and then, Ah. Second of all, the um, the outworking of God's kingdom in overthrowing the kingdoms of this world, we have that completed in one aspect in the book of Acts, where mm-hmm. Paul has walked into Rome, the last of the great right. empires, and said Jesus is king and nobody stops him. And that's... Right. That's called winning, right? Yeah, um, and that's why that book ends there. Not, right. with Paul, not with what happens to Paul, but it's about the kingdom of God. And game, set, match. <laughs> yeah. You could have stopped, but you didn't. You and we know that Nero is right around the corner. We know yeah. that all sorts of stuff politically is still right around the corner in the kingdom of this world. But God has won. Um, mm. the, the victory of the gospel is still intact, and it's still going forth, and it's still going to the ends of the earth. So victory might not look like what we would normally think of as victory, but it's the victory of the gospel. And right. that's very different and surprising. <laughs> this should have been our Christmas episode. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe oh, we could, it'll, it'll do us a New Year's episode. Yeah, yeah. Besides, I'm a Presbyterian. Christmas is all year round. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> I get Easter every Sunday, guys. <laughs> so do the people who celebrate Easter once a year. Almost right. <laughs> All right. We should wrap up. So Yeah, we should. Recommendations? Yeah, I got one since you brought up the subject of eschatology. This is a little bit harder to find. David Chilton, who wrote many good things and some things for the end of his life, which are a little... Uh, I wrote a, a, a book called Paradise Restored. It's an introdu- introduction to biblical theology, starting with garden imagery, leading up through a discussion of the coming of Christ and the kingdom of God, the destruction of Jerusalem, and where the gospel goes from there. Uh, if only as a primer, a primer to biblical theology, it is well worth your time. Although, as with everything, read with the Bible in hand, check him out along the lines. But if you also want an introduction to what postmillennialism can look like, this is a good place to start. Uh, also, J. Marcellus Kick's um, book, An Eschatology of Victory, which is an exegesis of uh, Matthew 24 and Revelation 20. Uh, if you want history, you can read uh, Ian Murray's book on the Puritans, The Puritan Hope, where he talks about how this kind of optimism shaped 
the uh, revivalism, uh, the good revivalism, the missionary impulse of the 1700s and 1800s. So those, there, there's a number of things that aren't too technical. And even if you don't buy into everything, I think will nonetheless be a blessing to you. Cool. Thanks. All right. I'm going to recommend listening to Brian's recommendations <laughs> because uh, David and I have been enjoying the uh, classic TV adaptation of All Creatures Great and Small. I've read, I think, three of the books. I haven't read all of them, but I, I've read and enjoyed a fair number of them. And I've never seen the TV show until now. So we're in the middle of season two and it's our, like, we can hardly think about going to sleep at night until we've watched one because they're just <laughs> so charming. And uh, sometimes it's just very painful, the the awkward situations. <laughs> oh, Tristan. The, Tristan. Tristan. and Didn't like, Tristan go on to be Doctor Who? Yes, the actor. Did he? Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. I just forgot the name. It's Doctor number three, though. Yeah. Oh, okay. I I've seen like some of Doctor Who number one, and then no, I've sorry, seen like the third Eccleston and on. So no. I missed like Tom Baker and all oh, the Oh, Tom ones Baker, in the you gotta see. Anyway, yeah, moving <laughs> anyway, on. This is not a Doctor Who recommendation, although <laughs> we all have. Yeah, sorry, it was the fifth that. Doctor, uh, okay. Pete, Pete Davison. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. All right, Brian, do you got one? I have two, actually, uh, mm -hmm. because I feel the contrarian urge. My first recommendation is to recommend Kim Riddlebarger's excellent book, A Defense of Amillennialism. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm not contrarian enough to ever recommend anything in defense of premillennialism. Um, <laughs> no, you will, find, you will find good things in that book, to be sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I always so say I'm an all-millennial because the all-millennialists say the least. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I, I feel that. Uh, uh, but yeah. uh, that's that's my first one, and then my second one is um, since we since I brought up uh, the Virgin Mary, the Theotokos, uh, mm -hmm. as we all should re honestly should refer to her as such because it is a Christological term <laughs> and not a Mariological term. I am going to recommend reading. Cyril of Alexandria's five tomes against Nestorius. Do not be fooled by the name. They are not that long because paper was I was going to say, that then. sounds like a commitment, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's fairly short. I think I could probably read it in three hours total. Mm -hmm. it, it's like, it's all free. It's online. You can just pull it up in your browser. And I, I've read about half of it myself and then i forgot about it and i need to go back and finish it which means restarting so it from the beginning in three hours you i read half of it in an hour yourself. and a half <laughs> you should record yourself reading it aloud in three hours so then i can just listen to the audio <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> if it's all public domain I mean, mm, the deal i mean honestly um but yeah Someone it's to provide that service for the church really <laughs> a lot of old stuff that people would listen to Ah, honestly, I, I might consider doing that moving forward. That's a that's a good idea for my time. Mm -hmm. But yes, uh, I remember reading it through and there's just really, on top of the excellent theological content and, uh, you know, writing against heretical uh, views of Christ, there's just so much sass. I mean, the, the <laughs> church fathers Which were just like- Which is what Cyril gets a lot of flack for. He was too sassy and rude. He Couldn't he be nice to Nestorius? Yeah, well, uh, some well, people don't deserve no. to be nice. It, your point. It was so great. Like, there's literally one point where he goes like, he quotes something from Nestorius, and Nestorius calls the orthodox view heretical. Yeah. And he goes like, Look! Look here! How him who was a heretic has styled the right view heresy. Like yeah. <laughs> you can't make this up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. Awesome recommendations. Thank you guys so much for this conversation. It's been a delight. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to you, our supporters and our listeners. Um, if you'd like to become a financial supporter of the show, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. Or you can keep supporting us just by listening and praying for us. We appreciate that too, uh, very much. Um, if you'd like to get in touch, you can send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Thanks so much. See you next time.